Public Library again doing another Flashback Friday. Today's Flashback Friday is a little different. We are here at the Whiting Public Library and although nothing else has um, ever been inside these doors, the library has definitely changed over the years. The first steps towards a public library were taken in the summer of 1904. At that time, the Indiana Public Library Commission was contacted in the hopes of soliciting um, help in forming of a library. After receiving the request, uh, Mercia Hoagland came to address the uh, Whiting citizens. At this meeting, uh, she helped organize the outline of what was necessary to form a, li a wide, uh, public library. The Whiting Public Library held their first meeting on November 17, 1904. At this meeting, the board voted to write to Andrew Carnegie in regards to a gift for the funding of a library structure. After a receipt of a letter um, from Carnegie, he pledged to donate $15,000. The library received a commitment letter for Carnegie on January 9, 1905. The projected cost of the library building was $20,000. Bonds totaling $5,000 were issued to cover the difference for a total of $25,000. Once the funding for the building was secured, the board took up the issue of acquiring a building site. The trustees turned their attention to another industrial giant, this time J.D. Rockefeller. The Standard Oil Company donated two 40-foot lots here at the corner of Oliver and Ohio Avenue. Meanwhile, temporary rooms for the library were rented in the Peterson block at the corner of Sheridan Avenue and 119th Street. On September 11, 1905, Paul Moritz of Bloomington, Illinois submitted plans for the library. The board immediately accepted Moritz's designs. Paul Moritz was among Central Illinois' most prominent architects. He was known for his Carnegie Library designs. He built libraries in Lincoln, Pekin, Peoria, Mount Vernon, Centralia, and Kankakee using money from Andrew Carnegie, who fin financed thousands of libraries in the United States. In October of 1905, work on this build building site was begun. The board hired John F. Reese to serve as the general contractor. For several years, Reese devoted his time mainly to building structures for libraries endowed by Andrew Carnegie. On December 2, 1905, the laying of the library's cornerstone was held with the appropriate ceremonies led by the Whiting Masonic Lodge. In the corner over here, you can see that the cornerstone says, a gift of Andrew Carnegie, A.D. 1905. And I also have a photograph of the Masonic Lodge as they were laying the cornerstone in 1905. And then I have a photograph of Paul Moritz, and he was the building's architect. And I lost my papers, so just give me one second here. During, the, during 1905, the library moved twice, once to the Putnam Building located on the corner of Shrug Avenue and 119th Street, and then in January, the library moved to its permanent home here um, at 1735 Oliver Street. The Whiting Public Library opened its doors to the public on July 31, 1906. The building was constructed of red Illinois hydraulic pressed bricks with trimmings of Portage Entries Quarry Company stone. 
The roof consisted of a green tile shingles, and the building was designed in the Romanesque style of architecture, with its tower representing the most prominent feature. I do have some photographs of what the library looked like in the original construction. And then I do have a couple more here. And we're gonna go inside and continue the program so let's go and while we get there I'll just read a little bit more the library structure was a one-story building with a basement finished uh, for it to be used the whole main floor was finished in sycamore wood while the basement was finished in birch the library furniture furniture was of golden oak and it was furnished by the Library Bureau. We still have in the local history room some original file cabinets from when the building was constructed. And we do have the original um, cards catalogs from um, 1906 as well. So let's go in the library real quick. The building was heated by steam and lit, lit by electricity and gas. The floors were carpeted with cork carpet, except in the vestibule and delivery rooms where the floors were covered with rubber tiles. And the walls were painted in greens and creams. I'm gonna take you upstairs real quick. The entrance of the library at that time was only on Oliver Street. And you entered the library and you came upon a large rotunda, is what, that's where we're at now. And the, and the rotunda led to a vestibule and then the delivery desk and the circulation desk upon that. To the north of the rotunda was the adult reading and reference rooms. And after some time, this area was converted to a student study room. The large room served as a, uh, as a children's room until 1926. Until that time, the room was transferred to the adult reading room. If you can see here, this is what the library originally looked like in 1905. Behind you, you could still see the archways. Here's another picture of the library's original interior. then I want to show you what the library originally looked like when you walked in you could see that the circulation desk met you right at the top of the stairs and if you could look in the background there was a second story um, that was behind the circulation desk um, there was a catwalk that ran all the way around the top and they had storage there was a metal um, little staircase that you would have to use to get up there um, and that's where they had to store a lot of the material. And if we go over here, if Joel, if you can get a view up at the top here, 
you can notice there's a little geometric shape that's in the ceiling. There used to be a stained glass that was in there and the light would shine through the stained glass. Later on during a renovation in the 1980s, they removed that stained glass. And the contractors decided that that was going to be a nice piece of uh, stained glass that they were going to take with them. Um, luckily, a library board member at the time, he saw this uh, sitting in the back of one of the contractor's pickup trucks. And he was able to rescue it uh, before it was um, taken away from the library. And we would never have been able to see that again. I'm going to show some more photographs of what the interior of the library is. Um, as you can see in the top photograph, there is a picture of the cornerstone as it uh, originally appeared. And those are some of uh, the staircases that you would have to traverse in order to get to different parts of the library. In the second photograph, you could see what it looked like uh, as you walked to the top of the stairs. Well, you could tell the library was definitely very crowded at the time. There was uh, lots of archways all over and every square inch of the building was jam-packed. And then again, I have a photograph of um, some more book stacks, the circulation desk, and a work room. And then here we go, we have some more photographs of the children's department as it looked at that time. And on the bottom picture, you can see that the library over the years got so crowded that they had to uh, put their uh, mag uh, magazine col collection right next to the furnace. Probably was not the safest situation to put uh, the circulation uh, items there. And then I showed this earlier. There's a picture of a staff member at the circulation desk. You have a photograph of the staff room and um, what the original uh, library looked at with all the archways that we still have standing today. And like I said, behind the circulation desk, there was a main book room and stack room. The book room contains six double-faced steel stacks furnished from the Art Metal Company. All of the books for the adult readers were stored in the book room. The reference books were housed in the North Tower Room. And likewise, the children's storybooks were stored in the South Room off of the Rotunda. Two smaller rooms opened out off the main stack room. One was used as a boardroom, and the other one room was the staff work room. Now I'm going to show um, the two north and south rooms. They're still oper operating as part of the library. And the an interesting feature about the library is we have the original fireplaces that were here. They are still operational. The library does not utilize them very often. But on special occasions, we do um, light the fireplaces. In the basement of the library, there were three rooms besides the boiler room. The smallest room was used as a storage room for the um, periodicals, and the other two rooms were used as an auditorium and club room. For many years, the Whiting's Women's Club held their monthly meetings in this room. In the winter months, the library sponsored lecture series, which were held in the auditorium. In the addition, the lower level housed a men's smoking room. And I have a card what, which was handed out to men in 1906. And it says that only men were able to use the smoking room. Women were not allowed, and they needed one of these cards in order to have access. I also have the original rules and regulations that we have on file. Um, these were handed out to library patrons when they got their new library card and it lists um, all of the pertinent information 
that you would want to know about becoming a new library patron. In the men's smoking room, there was magazines and books that were of interest to men, and that's where male patrons could smoke their cigarettes and cigars if they choose. The Whiting Public Library were, was originally open for circulation every day except for Sundays, and they were open from 2 to 9 p.m. However, the library's reading room was open on Sunday from 1.30 to 5.30. The room contained several newspapers and magazines, and anyone who obtained the signature of a Whiting taxpayer was allowed to check out books. We're going to go ahead and go over to the other part. This would have been the South Rotunda Room. And just like you saw in the North Rotunda Room, we do have the original fireplaces. Due to overcrowding in the 1920s, it was necessar necessary to make some changes to the library's layout. The auditorium room in the basement was converted to the children's room, and although the space did not provide much area for stacks, it worked nicely, considering there was no other option. Supervision of the children was much improved under this transformation. Children also had more freedom because they had their own space. The children's apartment was closed at 6 p.m., leaving the rest of the library for adults only. Throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the library's collection continued to grow and it put stress on the bones of this structure. A building that once held 2,588 items in 1906 had grown to 52,551 volumes in, by 1969. The overcrowding had reached a critical state. The library during this time had 10,000 square feet of materials crammed into 5,600 square feet of space. We're going to go downstairs to the children's department um, to finish off the presentation. And as we go downstairs, I will continue the story of the Whiting Public Library. The future of the Whiting Public Library grew to a fever pitch. There were three options during this period. One, remodel and expand the original Carnegie Library. Two, tear down the library and build a new structure. And three, move the library and all of its items to City Hall. Fearing that the library was, that the beloved Carnegie Library would be demolished, the Friends of the Library started a Save the Library campaign. And this is one of the flyers that they put together um, encouraging the neighborhood to come together and rally behind uh, keeping the library open. They were able to uh, be victorious in their, their crusade to save the library. Um, groundbreaking for the renovation, which doubled the size of the original library, was held in May of 1981. And the estimated cost of the construction of the new library was a million dollars. A lot more money than it was originally to build, which was $25,000. The architectural firm of Went, Cedar Home and Tiffins Inc. Was, was able to blend the new addition with the original Carnegie structure. In addition, the original structure's bricks were clean and the sandstone foundation was restained to match the new color scheme. On July 25, 1982, the Whiting Public Library held a rededication ceremony for the renovated structure. While maintaining the aesthetics of the original Carnegie building, the interior was now transformed into a modern and efficient facility. The arch rooms now offered a browsing room with periodicals and audio video, uh, visual room, which you saw upstairs. And the children's department was expanded and it included an outdoor reading court. This is a photograph of what the outdoor reading court looked like. And it was actually right back here where um, you can see the, the children's activity room is now. A 100 seat meeting room was established to meet the needs of Whiting's various clubs. In addition, the renovation provided much needed workspace for the library staff. There was now a, a circulation, a text, uh, technical support area, and that's where the library prepares books um, before they go on the shelves. However, the library was again in need of a renovation towards the end of the 20th century. 
The project, which began in the summer of 1999, added an additional 2,300 square feet, and the total cost of the construction was $495,000. The new expansion included a two-story addition, which enclosed the reading court, as you can see there. In addition, a multi-purpose room and study room was established in the children's apartment. Likewise, the expansion opened up the adult browsing area and it provided an additional office space. All right, that's the, the journey of the Whiting Public Library. Check back here on Monday at 11 a.m. where I'll be baking uh, my grandmother's famous carrot cake for the What's on the Menu Monday. Also, in the next Flashback Friday will be on Friday, September the 25th at 12 p.m. See you then, and make sure you like, comment, and share. And thank you for joining us today.